We talk about the history of NATO. And when we talk about the history of NATO, we're really talking about the history of the American commitment to Europe. That's what really matters here. You take the Americans out of Europe, NATO is kaput. The reason you want to keep the Americans in Europe is because that's the way to maintain NATO, and virtually every country in Europe that is now a part of NATO wants the American security umbrella over their head. So when we talk about the history of NATO, this is the history of the American commitment to Europe. Let's talk about three periods. Before NATO was formed in 1949, and this is the period from 1900 to 1949. You all understand that in 1900, the United States finally established regional hegemony in the Western Hemisphere. As a result of the Spanish-American War in 1898, we were finally the dominant power in the Western Hemisphere. So I want to talk about U.S foreign policy towards Europe from 1900 to 1949. And of course, 1949 is when NATO is formed. So the Cold War NATO is 1949 to 1989. And then I want to talk about post-Cold War NATO. And then I'll go to the age of Trump, okay? So I want to give you a sense of how Americans thought about Europe before NATO's formed in 1949. The United States was an isolationist country from 1900 until 1917. When Woodrow Wilson ran for president in 1916, he campaigned on the slogan, I kept us out of war. There was a lot of opposition in the United States to entering World War I. The United States actually enters World War I in April of 1917. Okay, it's our first major foreign policy engagement abroad. First time that we really use large-scale military forces. The Americans had over two million soldiers, over two million soldiers in France by the time the war ended. 50,000 Americans died. So it was a sizable commitment. First commitment, military forces to Europe. The war ends, as you all know, November 11th, 1918. In fact, the 100th anniversary is coming up soon. We immediately pull all the combat forces out of Europe, and we leave a small occupation force. And then in January 1923, President Harding pulls that small occupation force out of Europe. So there's no American commitment to Europe after 1923, right? So it's from April 1917 when we get in to 1923. Then come the 1920s and the 1930s. And as you know, the United States was a thoroughly isolationist country. Hitler invaded Poland on September 1st, 1939. The United States did nothing. Hitler invaded France on May 10th, 1940. The United States did nothing. Japanese attacked us at Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941, and then, thank goodness, Franklin D. Roosevelt said, on December 11th, four days later, the Germans declared war against the United States. That's what got us into World War II. Roosevelt, dealing with isolationist America, could not get us involved in what was happening here in Europe when Hitler was on a rampage. It was not until after Pearl Harbor, when Hitler foolishly declared war against us, that we entered the war in Europe. Very important to understand this, because what you see is that the Americans, this is before we had nuclear weapons. This is a world where there are lots of powerful states in the system, like Germany and Japan and Russia slash the Soviet Union. The United States had a very powerful isolationist impulse. And again, it's because we are a remarkably secure great power. That's why Romanians, Danes, Germans, other Europeans worry about us going home. Right? And the basis of that isolationism is the fact that we are so secure. Right? But anyway, we get involved in World War II, and we play a major role, the Americans, in defeating the Germans. But, of course, it's the Soviet Union that plays the key role in defeating the Germans. Very important to understand that. And when the war ended, the Soviet juggernaut, 
was in the heart of Europe. But the Soviets and the Americans were allies. We had fought together with the British against Nazi Germany. So when war, the war ends here in Europe in May of 1945, the United States and the Soviet Union are allies. Question is, what are we going to do? You know what we wanted to do? We wanted to come home. We did not want to stay in Europe. We're certainly not going to stay in Europe with large-scale ground forces. We're coming home. And by the way, we had not yet defeated Japan. Japan is not defeated until August 1945. So we were going to pull those forces out of Europe and send them to fight against Japan, which we thought at the time we would have to invade. We thought that was going to involve huge numbers of forces. But more generally, we had no interest in staying in Europe. We had no history of staying in Europe. America is a deeply isolationist country at the time. The problem is we face a potential peer competitor in Europe. That's the Soviet Union. Because as I told you before, the Soviet Union played the key role in defeating Germany. And it was sitting there, with all that military force, in the middle of Europe. And my third point here is that the West Europeans were not in a position to contain the Soviet Union. Germany was in ruins. France had been occupied between 1940 and 1945 by the Germans and was in terrible shape. Britain was badly damaged by the war. Its economy was hurt. Plus it had this huge empire that it had to manage, which limited its capacity to influence events here in Europe. So the United States had no choice but to stay in Europe. You understand it. In the late 1940s, remember NATO's formed in 1949, we were not anxious to stay in Europe. We were forced to stay in Europe because the Soviet Union was a potential peer competitor in Europe, which is the most important area of the world for the United States at that point in time. We care about Europe. We do not want any single great power dominating Europe. Then the question becomes, who's going to contain that European power that might overrun the place? And the answer is, there's nobody to do it. So we have to do it. So Uncle Sam, also known as Uncle Sugar, decides to stay in Europe. What exactly does that mean? Actually, at the beginning, NATO was very weak militarily. When the United States pushed for the legislation from Congress to create NATO, there was huge resistance, huge resistance among the elite. And when Dean Acheson and others were pushing to create NATO, they were not emphasizing the importance of putting military forces in Europe because they knew that the American public would have little appetite for that and large chunks of the American elite would have little interest in doing that. Slowly but steadily in the 1950s, we begin to build up our military forces in Europe. But the Eisenhower administration, and you all know Eisenhower is in power from January 1953 until January 1961. President Eisenhower wins two terms. President Eisenhower is actually very interested in getting out of Europe and turning over containment of the Soviet Union to the West Europeans. We want to resurrect German power in the form of West Germany and get the French, the British, and the West Germans to contain the Soviet Union so we can go home. See, so you want to understand that, that impulse to leave Europe, it, it's been there for a long time. Then come the Kennedy years. And President Kennedy, who of course is assassinated in November of 1963, but before he's assassinated, he basically sets in stone the American commitment to Europe. Right? Kennedy decides that all this talk about leaving Europe doesn't make sense. We should commit ourselves to staying in Europe. But what happens in 1965 is the United States goes into Vietnam. And this is a catastrophic war. You cannot imagine the extent to which it tore apart the United States. It was just horrible, right? There was so much opposition to the war. 
and we did so poorly in the war, right, that what happened was we began to talk about pulling back from all over the world, right? We began to talk about pulling forces out of Korea. This was the Nixon doctrine. And there was a lot of emphasis in greatly reducing our commitment to Europe. This is the famous Mansfield Amendment, which is all about reducing the American commitment to Europe. And this is a consequence in large part of the Vietnam War. And the fact that the American public, and even large chunks of the elite at this point in time, are fed up with all these military commitments around the world. The Mansfield Amendment is defeated in Congress and the United States stays in Europe. Then comes 1975. This is very important. And I put a star next to 1975, and I refer to the period from 1975 to 1989 as the golden years. This is when the American foreign policy establishment becomes firmly committed to NATO. Uh, note here, I'm not saying the American public, right? I'm saying the foreign policy establishment in 1975 becomes firmly committed to NATO. Now what happened there? It's very simple, because I started graduate school in 1975, and I can tell you the mindset, and it influenced my initial research in graduate school. Vietnam War ends in 1975. Vietnam War basically runs from 65, 1965 to 1975. When the Vietnam War is over with, the last thing the United States wants to think about is intervening in another country in the third world with military force. So what we do is we focus laser-like on Europe. Europe becomes the center of attention for people who study strategy. The foreign policy establishment says, let's think about Europe. Let's not think about another Vietnam. Foreign policy establishment at that point in time becomes firmly committed to Europe. No more doubts, no more Mansfield Amendment. And from that day up to the present, you're dealing with a foreign policy establishment that is firmly committed to staying in Europe come hell or high water. Very important to understand that. Talk about the post-Cold War period. I remember just on the golden years, I put the golden years 75 to 89, right? But then down bottom I said the commitment reign remains unchanged. So now we're in the post-Cold War period, right? This is the period that you are familiar with, because I would imagine that almost everyone here was born in the post-Cold War period. What happens here, very interesting. First of all, when the Cold War ends and the Soviets pull out of Eastern Europe, which is wonderful news for Romania, Poland, Hungary, the Czech Republic, when the Soviet Empire in Europe comes to an end, the Soviets, in the form of Mikhail Gorbachev and his lieutenants, get together with the Americans to talk about the future of NATO. And I don't know if you know this, but the Soviets want the Americans to stay in Europe, and the Soviets want NATO to remain intact. And the main reason is that the Soviets, like you, understand that the Americans are the pacifier. But unlike you, the Soviets are not worried about themselves, they're worried about the Germans. And what they like is the idea of Uncle Sam staying in Europe, keeping NATO intact, and keeping the Germans down. We used to say during the Cold War, I'm sure many of you have heard this fancy phrase, the purpose of NATO is to keep the Soviets out, the Americans in, and the Germans down. The Soviets are now out. So the name of the game, from the Soviet point of view, is to keep the Americans in and keep the Germans down. And by the way, the Germans like this arrangement because the Germans are afraid of themselves. The Germans don't like to look at themselves in the mirror. Ah! Right? <laughs> 
So the Germans go along with this. And by the way, the Germans are not reunified at the time. East and West Germany are not reunified. And they know if the Americans are there, and the Soviets and everybody else is not fearful of what the implications are of German unification, it'll take place in a relatively smooth way. And of course, that's exactly what happens. But it's very important to understand that what the Soviets do not want under any circumstances is NATO expansion. They do not want NATO moving eastward, which makes perfect sense from their point of view. They do not want this alliance that was their adversary from 1949 to 1989 marching towards their border. So they want NATO to remain intact, but they want it to stay in place. Second point is, this is the era of unipolarity. The United States is the sole pole, the only pole. We're the dominant state on the planet by far. But this is a period where we abandon basic realpolitik and we adopt liberal hegemony. And you're saying to yourself, what exactly is liberal hegemony? We decide, and I'm going to talk about this in the context of NATO expansion, we decide that what we want to do is we want to expand this liberal order that we created in Western Europe to include Eastern Europe. What we want to do is we want to bring you Romanians into the EU. We want to bring you into NATO. We want to make sure that you're a vibrant democracy. We want to make sure that you're hooked on capitalism. We want to make sure that you're part of the West. And what we want to do is take NATO, the EU, these institutions we created during the Cold War, and we want to move them eastward. And I know you're going to find it's hard to believe, but it is true. We did not move NATO eastward to counter a potential Russian threat. That was a story we invented after the February 22nd, 2014 crisis in Ukraine started. In fact, you can read, go home and Google Madeleine Albright, go home and Google Michael McFaul, right? Prominent Americans who dealt with Putin, who told Putin on numerous occasions that NATO expansion was not aimed at containing Russia. What we were doing instead was trying to create a giant security community based on liberal principles that enclosed or covered the entire European continent, right? The idea here was that if the continent was covered by nothing but democracies, they were all embedded in international institutions, and they were all part of an open international economy that we would all live happily ever after. To put it in terms that you would understand, we would have peace, love, and dope. And this was the idea. Right. The idea was not to move NATO eastward for the purposes of containing the Russians. That's the basis of NATO expansion. And of course, there are two big expansions. The first one is in 1999. This is when Poland comes in, the Czech Republic comes in, Hungary comes in. And then the second big wave of NATO expansion is in 2004. And that's when Romania, the Baltic states, and a number of other countries come into NATO. Okay? The Soviets, then the Russians, did not want NATO expansion. And from the mid-1990s forwards, the Russians screamed bloody murder about NATO expansion. But they could not do anything about it. And they were not willing to do anything about it. Then comes the 2008 Bucharest summit. This is when the trouble starts, right, right here in Bucharest. Uh, when the summit is over with, NATO issues a decree which says unequivocally that Georgia and Ukraine will become part of NATO. It was impossible because of German opposition, and to a lesser extent, French opposition, for NATO to address that issue 
during the actual Bucharest summit. Nevertheless, the Americans insisted when the summit was over with that this decree be issued which said that Ukraine and Georgia would become part of NATO. The Russians had had enough with NATO expansion. They went ballistic. And they basically made it clear that a red line had been drawn in the sand. And there was going to be no more NATO expansion in Eastern Europe. Not surprisingly, in August 2008, remember the Bucharest summit here, Bucharest, April 2008, in August 2008, not surprisingly, you have a war between Russia and Georgia. Because Georgia is operating under the illusion that it can get tough with the Russians and the Americans and the West Europeans will protect them because we intend to bring Georgia into NATO. But of course, the West Europeans and the Americans do nothing and Russia wins the war against Germany. Then the second big crisis comes in February 2014, February 22nd, 2014 to be exact. And you end up not only with a war in the eastern part of Ukraine involving the Russians, but the Russians take Crimea. This is all a result of the Bucharest summit and it's a result of the fact that NATO expansion went too far. My next point to you is this is the return of realpolitik. This is why you hear all sorts of Romanian politicians, American politicians, NATO politicians saying that Russia is a threat, we have to do this, we have to do that. It's a fundamentally different world than existed before February 22, 2014. If you look at the Cold War, Cold War, let's say 1947 to 1989, realpolitik across the board. 1989, Cold War ends, up to 2014, liberal hegemony. After 2014, realpolitik returns. This is the world that you all have been brought into over the past four years. I'll talk more about this in a minute, but you want to understand that what else happens in the 2000s is that you get the continuing rise of China and you get the resurrection of Russian power. China really begins to sort of, begins to get integrated into the international economy that the United States created during the Cold War with the help of the Europeans and its Asian allies. The Chinese start in the early 1980s. And in the early 1990s, when the Cold War ends, the Chinese are beginning to grow at a rather impressive rate. By 2005, 2010, China looks like it has the potential to turn into a real gorilla. And not only that, the Russians come back from the dead. I don't know how many of you know this, but in the 1990s, Russia was in absolutely horrible shape. The end of the Cold War was a disaster for the Soviet Union, then Russia, right? And uh, they had remarkably little military power. Their economy was a wreck. Putin comes to power in 2000, and from that point forward, the Russians slowly begin to claw their way back. And this is why we say today we're moving from a world of unipolarity to multipolarity. Multipolarity, China, Russia, and the United States. That's the post-Cold War world in a nutshell. 